Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to an episode of Health Ignited with my lovely, amazing wife, Dr. Sonia Jensen. How's it going today? It's going well. It's yeah, going we're well. We're having some good conversations. We are. Yeah. We've got an amazing guest on. And this guest has actually been on our Dr. Dad's podcast twice already. This, uh, as we said over there, he's, he's going to be a resident um, speaker and presenter just because he's got such a crazy diverse background of so many things. So I'm going to give you a little bit of... Uh, his background, a uh, short snippet of the multifaceted human being that we're about to introduce to you guys. So his name is Dr. Perry Nicholson. He's a chiropractic physician with primary focus on uh, performance enhancement, corrective exercises, and metabolic fitness nutrition, and trained from the American College of Addictionology and Compulsive Disorders. He's an expert in myofascial orthopedic, medical and trigger point soft tissue therapy, a member of the board of directors and medical staff advisor for the AIMLA, which is the American Institute of Medical Laser Application. Dr. Perry teaches healthcare professional, professionals all over the world how to successfully use class four deep tissue laser therapy in alleviating pain. Director of clinical protocols and training for light cure medical lasers specializing in myofascial laser treatments. His, his resume continues, but I will digress so we can just get this conversation rolling because uh, we, we started a couple really great conversations on the Dr. Dad's podcast, and there's so much to what you shared. And I wanted today to really help us understand <clears throat> the emotional connection to the pain that we feel. And I want to get there, but eventually, but to start off with, I wanted to just talk, talk about the fluid of lymph, because really this conversation that we've started two episodes ago was helping to understand fluid dynamics, uh, chronic pain, chronic inflammation, this, uh, you know, the whole teaching on uh, the body aquarium and moving lymphatics and why we get sick and why we why we're not getting well, and to stop chasing pain and all these stories and discussion were on those previous podcasts. And I encourage you, know, you the listener to develop that um, uh, discussion or that knowledge by going through those uh, topics first and then come here. But what I want to lead this conversation eventually into that emotional aspect to why we feel pain and where we store it is let's just talk about the fluid of lymph. Like what is this fluid and what makes it unique? And let's start there. Great. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the show, doctors. It's uh, really an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, yeah, I could, I could talk about lymph all day long, and you know that I do, so I'll try to keep it short. But I, I read a quote once when I was studying this of a doctor who said, lymph is life. I mean, that pretty much sums it up, right? If you think about it logically, I mean, we're, most of our body is a, a fluid dynamic. We think of water, right? I mean, we are a significant amount of water. 60 to 70 percent depending on the stats but that's the whole body but you have different areas of your body that are up to 90 percent water so lymph being one of them that's why we're going to talk about water later that's really important because dehydration is a huge driver for autoimmune and chronic pain and most people don't even know that they are dehydrated even though they're drinking a lot of water <laughs> so but yeah the, the lymphatic system to me is the most important and neglected system in the human body in relationship to optimizing health and healing and recovery and regeneration. It's just not a system that you really hear a lot about, honestly. Maybe in the realm of cancer, that's when you usually hear it, that somebody says you have cancer and it can spread through your lymphatic system, and it can. But when I heard that, I mean, like, that should tell you something right there, that lymphatic probably goes everywhere if the cancer can spread through it. But here's the thing, the lymphatic system is also designed to destroy cancer. It actually kills cancer every single day of your life so you don't get cancer, all right? So it, it plays a huge role in your immunity. So basically your lymphatic system is a fluid-filled system in your body that's part of your cardiovascular system. And that's something that many people don't know either. The cardiovascular system, people think of usually heart and blood flow. Well, the lymphatics tap directly into that and through your venous system, the veins of the body. That's what takes fluid back towards the heart so it can go to the lungs and get new oxygen and bring oxygen and nutrients out into the system so you can heal, recover, and regenerate. So the lymphatics attack attach directly to that. 
And so they're part of your cardiovascular system, which means if the lymphatics don't work efficiently, your cardiovascular system won't work efficiently. And actually your heart has to work harder. So it's tied to high blood pressure quite a bit, but it's uh, part of your immune system as well. It's a significant player in your immune system. And that's our ability to live longer, happier lives and fight off diseases or infections or sicknesses or illnesses. And it just helps the body kill things. That's what the immune system does. It gets rid of things in your body that you don't want in there. And if it doesn't work that well, then things that are not supposed to stay in your body stay in there longer. And then we usually feel the effects of that. Here's the key. Uh, usually much later than, than we think we, we will. It's not an immediate thing that happens. It's, sl it's a slowly progressing type thing. And that's why it's not looked at a lot because they can't see what does this have to do with anything because it took so long for my quote unquote pain or autoimmune disease to develop. And that's where it becomes very tricky uh, because it's not, it's not blatantly obvious to you until you learn about it. And then when you learn about it, you realize, holy cow, it was staring me in the face the whole time. I just never even knew that I should be looking there. So it's basically a system that I call the sewage system of your body. And it's designed to get rid of toxins. What kind of toxins? Bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungus, cancer, uh, um, exogenous toxins from the outside world, and endogenous toxins. Those are the toxins from your own body, right? Because when you have cells that you have cells that die every day because they're supposed to, <laughs> and then you make new ones. And then the old ones are called metabolic cellular waste. And it's just like any other waste. If that doesn't get out of your body, then your own body becomes toxic to your own body. You follow? Mm -hmm. And so you're basically sitting in your own metabolic cellular waste waste. And that happens even through breathing. With the very act of breathing through your lungs, you create what, you, what we call oxidative stress, free radicals. And that's tied to the autoimmune disease and systemic full body inflammation that we get. Well, you exhale a lot of liquid every single day. I think it's like two cups a day that you actually wow. exhale of liquid. And you've got lymph and your lungs too. You've got lymph in every organ, even your eyeball, you've got lymph in there. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Once you see it, you're gonna be literally astounded of how much it interconnects with and plays a vital role to your health. And that's my mission right now is to just help people realize what it is and then try to give them some strategies to help them um, take care of it, simply take care of it. So awesome. you had said something that um, I think is really important that people don't recognize that there's an issue in the lymph for a while because the signs and symptoms may not be present that are loud enough for someone to recognize that something is off because normally the body will whisper in the beginning. So what are some of those whisper signs that people can pay attention to? Maybe it is just not drinking enough or quality water or whatever that is, but what are some things that people can start kind of paying attention to so they don't have to get to the point where their body is screaming at them? That's a great question. What's well, the subtle signs of everyday life that we think are normal and they're not? Mm -hmm. uh, tiredness, fatigue, lethargy, uh, Soreness, aches, pains, um, you know, you, 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 uh, brain fog, you start, you start to lose your mental capacity on things. And it's just stuff that we think of, oh, it's the, you're just getting older type of thing. And that's usually uh, probably not, right? <laughs> just because you're getting older doesn't mean you're supposed to fall apart. I mean, that's what medicine expects you to believe. Um, but you're, you're supposed to be nice and strong and resilient uh, till the very end. You really are. I mean, everything's got a shelf life, but nobody says you have to be miserable when you're getting towards the end of your shelf, right? Um, so it's a, it's a stiffness and tightness in the body is a big one. And you actually start to get sick more often 
than you normally do. And migrating pain is a big one where, you know, I have achingness in my knee today and then it's in my shoulder the next day and then it's in my back that then, then you feel like it's all over the place. So those so subtle things, and that's just a sign of systemic, which means full body underlying inflammation. So I was, I like to study classic um, old school medicine in a way, looking at the, the foundation from years past, hundreds of years past of looking at, of how we looked at the body then. Because I think, honestly, I know we have much more technology now, but I think that we're going into such a minutia of studying things. We don't know how to put big pictures together anymore. And physicians needed to do that back then because they didn't have the ability to look at things so closely in a microscope. And physicians in the past actually touched their patients. But you don't find that anymore today. It's look at the lab results or this, this, this. And I'm like, when's the last time you put your hand on anybody's abdomen to see anything or feel anything? So they had this wonderful way of connecting physiology together. And that's what I love to do. I was actually reading an osteopathic book from 1898 this morning. And I loved it because it was actually written in a, with a typewriter. You guys remember those things? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I, have to t I have to tell the kids that are listening, look up typewriter for a picture. <laughs> kind of like looking up an album. <laughs> and uh, I was reading it and it was just, I, it's 458 pages long and I'm only 25 pages in and I've blown my mind. And they were talking back then in 1898, exactly what I'm telling you right now which is the relationship of the fluids of the body and that they use the word sewage of the body. And they had a phrase there where they looked at pathology. They said the path to pathology is congestion and congestion is stagnation, right? Mm -hmm. Congestion of body fluids from lymphatic to vascular, even to uh, water because you're dehydrated. And then congestion leads to inflammation. And inflammation is the key to chronic disease, right? And autoimmune disease. And then that leads to degeneration. And then degeneration. And then that's when we get all these diagnosis names, when you've degenerated to the point where now I can give you a label because now you fall into this box, right? And then now degeneration will actually go into, and that's where you'll start to get uh, growths or tumors. And then that is where they manifest things like cancer. It's a, cancer is a process that's a, that doesn't just jump you overnight. It's a step-by-step -step process that, that gets you. I know, because I had it. Like you mentioned, we were talking about before, I had thyroid cancer 18 years ago. And uh, so, you know, it's, it, it's the whole system well, all the systems have to work together. And what stuck with me is just a, the fluid-filled environment that we live in. I've been chasing solid tissue, and you should. But now, here's the reframe. When I treat solid tissue, I'm always thinking about what is that doing to the fluid dynamics underneath it? Like, how is that influencing all of the other fluids in the body? So when I work with, for instance, you have the lymphatic system, you have clusters, of what we call lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are where uh, the lymph goes in and the immune system gathers in and attacks it and the nodes here a lot. And you've got six or 700 of those nodes and each node, it kills it more and more and more. And they're in strategic areas of the body, the primary joints of the body that need to move the most. Back of the knees, the groin near the hip, uh, the shoulders, uh, the abdomen, and the top of the neck near the base of the skull. All the areas that you're supposed to have a lot of movement on so it can move the fluid. So let's give an example. In the past, I would be trying to treat your hip and let's say you had pain in your hip, but now if I'm in the crease of the groin over there, I'm not thinking about the psoas muscle and I'm not thinking about your inguinal ligament. I'm thinking about how that area influences the flow of lymph and uh, blood flow down, blood flow up uh, into the body and how that now can impact the other hip and then the back and then the rest of the body. And when you look at it like that, it, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, honestly. It, it 
puts so much things in perspective that answers the question of why, why things, why the body does what it does. It starts to make more sense when you look at it like that. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Totally. Well, I mean, I love that. I mean, you just think of all these different representations for that kind of phenomenon in like, you look at your home and if you don't take out the garbage, it's going to start smelling in your house. You know, if you, you know, it's, if you, if we don't get into our kid's room and help them clean up, it's going to be a complete disaster show and people are going to be stepping on their toys all over the place and falling down. It's going to create, you know, band-aid central kind of a situation. And, you know, that same process is happening with, within the body and the way that you speak to it is phenomenal. So I want to, I want to, let's talk about water for a sec. If you had to pick the most purest water to rehydrate the body, to fill all those fluid centers uh, with better hydration, more microclustering in the water, whatever it would be. What's, what's the perfect way to get that water in the body? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Well, um, yeah, I read a quote for somewhere, uh, somebody who said that, you know, there's no such thing as pure water in the body. Just cause you drink pure water doesn't mean that's the best thing you're supposed to be drinking because there's no pure water in your body. There's always something in it, right? If you think about that, because we come from the ocean, right? So you gotta have a lot of minerals in water, first of all. And uh, that's the biggest thing that I put in there. So it's very important that when I talk about water, I try to equate it to digestion because it's a little bit easier for people to comprehend it. Because I see so many people who drink six, seven glasses of water a day like they're supposed to, or I have athletes that carry around the gallon jug and they drink water all the time, but they're still dehydrated and they don't understand why. And I'm like, that's because you're not absorbing the water. And it's like digestion. So if you eat food, it has to go down your mouth and into your intestine. And then for your body to use it, it has to absorb the nutrients. So if you don't have the capacity to absorb the nutrients, then you're not going to get nutrients, right? Then the food's just going to go right through you. And then that's the person who is hungry all the time or eats all the time, but they're still just feel tired and fatigued because they're not absorbing nutrients in the body. Usually because they have a leaky gut. And when you have leaky gut, you have uh, inflammation in your lip because most of your lip sits around your gut anyway. And that feeds dehydration. And the same with water. So you drink regular water, it doesn't mean it's crossing the cellular membrane. It needs like salts or electrolytes or minerals is my favorite to put in there. And another reason it doesn't get absorbed is because if if you go back to that fluid filled environment and the lymphatics is supposed to keep the fluid that your cells sit in clean, quote unquote, purified. It's not really purified, but you understand what I'm saying. And if, if that's backed up with toxins and it becomes more viscous, it becomes thicker. And the way that your body tries to protect itself is that it has to dilute the toxicity because the cells are sitting in this uh, dense fluid with toxins. So in order to take away toxicity, it surrounds the cells with fluid, which means that the the fluid doesn't go into the cell, it sits around it because it's trying to take away the viscosity to, of the water, right? And it's a classic case of self-protection. The body says, I can't let you absorb the water because first of all, it can't get through the cell membrane because you're so toxic around the cell with the liquid that it can't even get in there. Same with oxygen. It says my first thing I need to do is try to protect the cell best I can. So I'm going to dilute the toxicity. And so you actually hold water and you can become puppy or swollen, but not hydrated. That makes sense. And Mm -hmm. so people just keep drinking and drinking or they drink purified water, which is the absolute worst. I mean, that's doing nothing, making you worse purified water. And then they put it in plastic, no less. So what I tell people to do for structured water just means this. You want to add structure to it, which means add something to it. It can be honestly almost anything. My favorite are taking um, minerals, liquid 
what they call trace minerals. Another name for it is fulvic slash humic minerals. It's basically, I tell people, it's liquid earth. It's the dirt that you're, that you're drinking. And, you know, nature's pretty smart. She puts things that you need on the earth. We don't always get the hint. But you take in those minerals, and then that's going to structure the water and help the absorption. And then what you find is, is that um, most people are missing a lot of minerals anyway because of the underlying inflammation in their body, and stress depletes minerals. So your body steals the minerals. And then what happens too is that you need enzyme reactions in your body in order to make energy. Energy is about enzyme reactions. That's what the Krebs cycle is. Some people may have heard of the Krebs cycle, the energy cycle all the way back in high school. And you need enzymes to make that happen. And you also need oxygen to make that happen. And here's the thing. You can't make enzymes without minerals. Enzymes are a catalyst, excuse me, minerals are a catalyst for enzymes. So if you're missing a mineral, you will not be able to make enzymatic reactions to complete the regeneration and healing that your body needs to do. And you're not going to get the minerals that you need through food anymore because it's mm -hmm. the, the soils are mineral deficient, the foods are mineral deficient, and they're sprayed with who knows how many chemicals or glyphosate and all sorts of different things. So um, you need to get it, put it in through the liquid fulvic and, and humix. That's my preferred way. And they are also great at detoxification. So they detox, detoxify the liver and the kidneys. So they're really, really good at that. Uh, that's, uh, that's my number one thing that I tell people to do. And you don't need to drink as much water either. Like people think you have to do eight to 12 glasses of water. Well, not if you're absorbing water, you don't. Because mm -hmm. you can easily get away with two or three. Right? And that's going to be based on your activity level anyway. But I also say you can do electrolytes, just adding electrolytes. I had a guy say to me, he, he would run all the time. He would train all the time. He said, I'm always so tired. I'm always so fatigued. I've got, uh, I don't know how much I sleep. I'm still tired. I feel my brain is going. And I'm like, I want you to add some electrolytes to your water. And as soon as he did that, I mean, within two days, he was completely different because it's about uh, absorption. You can put anything in there, a little, little uh, Celtic salt, a little depth of sea salt in there. Lemon in there works quite nicely. I have people actually put gemstones in the water. Um, sunlight does it. Moonlight does it, right? Why? Because that's, that's, that's massive energy right there. I mean, that's solar system universe energy right there. There's so many, many different ways that you can do it. It's just knowing that you need to put something in there, even um, even a little piece of fruit, even a vegetable can go in there. Organic is better, of course. But if I had to say, what's my number one? It's trace metals. That's the number one. And you'll notice a remarkable difference in, in how you feel, and it's going to tie into the lymphatics at the same time. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. Well, I just, I mean, I love how it's all connected and you were speaking to the text that you were reading this morning and just how everything is about that stagnation piece and that congestion, which creates the inflammation. And then the diagnosis, it just kind of reminded me of, you know, our training in like um, Chinese, ancient Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, they had that knowing and that's why they don't have names for these diseases or these diagnoses, but what they're speaking to is liver stagnation or they're speaking to something being held in like the lungs or in the kidneys. And it's all about the movement, whether you're using acupuncture or an Ayurvedic medicine, you're using massage to really shift the energy in that body. And you brought that together with the, the cancer picture that you experienced. And then I couldn't help thinking about breast cancer for women. Mm -hmm. in um, this area here and where our lymphatic system is and just that piece that I know we want to start moving into talking about with the, the pain and the emotions that we carry in these congested areas and in Chinese medicine, pain and congestion go hand in hand, like liver stagnation equals cramping or yeah. pain in certain areas. So if you can maybe tie all that together um, for us and how 
how we can start recognizing it and how, what we can do to start supporting that movement in those areas. So we're not, again, running away from the pain or we're not distracting ourselves with the pain and not recognizing that there's something, there's a layer underneath that signal that the body is giving us. Yeah. Great question. Well, that's what stop chasing pain means, right? I mean, we, we certainly treat pain, but chasing it means you just do stuff to wherever somebody puts their points, their finger all the time. To me, that's chasing. And that's not medicine. Honestly, um, medicine, you had better learn how to think if you want to get into medicine. And then I think we're losing that. We just follow these protocols for you've got this diagnosis. Here's what you're supposed to do for it. Uh, not so much. Maybe you need to change some variables up because it's about the person, not the, not the disease, right? And I love Ayurvedic medicine because one of their central tenets, they're one of the only, they're one of the few disciplines that talk primarily about lymphatics. They're huge in the lymphatics in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, they're also huge into that, into osteopathic medicine, or at least they used to be. That's why I like looking at the old osteopathic medicine, because the new osteopathic medicine, they're on par with MDs these days. They don't even teach the fundamental principles of osteopathic medicine. They don't even do that in chiropractic anymore. The philosophical mm -hmm. beginnings of chiropractic, they don't even like for you to talk about the subluxation and nerve flow and stuff like that, because they want to belong to the to the herd of everybody else, right? And uh, Chinese medicine has been talking about lymphatics and fluid flow for a while. They just call it qi. They just use a different word for it, right? And one thing that I try to teach people is just about all the systems of the body working together. So I think I've said this on the other pi podcast, and I say it all the time, is that no system in your body ever works alone. And by systems for people, I mean like nervous system, digestive system, immune system, things like that, cardiovascular system. Not a single one gets injured alone. So if you fall on your knee, it's not a musculoskeletal knee joint problem. It's a full body problem. And every other system that's in that knee is affected. And they never heal alone either. They all have to work together. And very often you'll find that people struggle to heal because people are chasing after the wrong system and they're blaming the quote unquote painful one. And most time the painful one is the musculoskeletal version. That's when people say my back hurts or my shoulder hurts or some body part hurts, but they blame the part. Now I'm not talking about acute traumatic injury. Like if you fall on your knee, well, that's pretty straightforward, right? And then you're just gonna treat, treat that. But then those injuries usually manifest as something later because it wasn't rehabilitated in a full system way or you'll manifest something later on in your neck from your knee that happened, right? That's, that's the history part. But when I, all these other systems are the ones that you mentioned that nobody thinks about. Like, I'm pretty sure that if you come on and you've got shoulder pain or back pain, the first thought to most people is not, I better look and make sure that your liver moves good and that your liver doesn't have any stagnation in it. That's probably not on their radar. Or I need to check the lymphatics that are uh, above your navel and your belly button because when it's congested there, it's going to affect the vascularization and blood flow to my low back that's causing me pain. They don't think that way because, well, my liver, it doesn't hurt there, right? That's what stop chasing pain means. And what then they say, what the hell does the liver have to do with your lower back? Well, if you understood physiology in any way, shape, or form, you know it has everything to do with your lower back. So it's just a matter of when you assess an area by hand, for instance, if I'm going to put you on your stomach and you have back pain, I'm going to press into your lower back and see if it hurts. But then I'm also going to turn you on your back and press into your stomach and see if it hurts because I need to look for areas of your body that have vulnerabilities that you don't know about. Right. And then those stagnation systems are big ones. The, the, you know, when I said congestion, I'm talking about congestion on being able to eliminate toxins and move fluid. So for me, uh, the lungs are huge players in relationship to that. The liver is a huge player in, in relationship to that. And the digestive system is, is probably the biggest one that most people know about. I mean, that's why you got to go to the bathroom. 
I mean, you're trying to get toxins out. And then a lot of people suffer from constipation, so toxins stay inside of their body. Or that tube that the food goes down has got holes in it, so all that food goes through your body and it, it appears as a toxin like that way. So it's just a matter of when, when I when I assess someone and try to help them understand how to put this puzzle piece together is I'm basically going to, I, in all honesty, I'm going to press with my fingers on literally every square inch of your body and see if anything hurts because it's not supposed to hurt. Or I'm going to look at your reaction to my pressure, or I'm going to look at your reaction to my hand getting anywhere near an area of the body. And then I'm just going to look and see what happens when I press there. And the longer I do this work, the less I really focus on where your pain is. I certainly will start there, right? But I'm going to look everywhere else. And that's one of the central tenets that I, it's very interesting how the universe works. I started to have this reframe for myself where I've noticed most of the time in helping somebody get better, it's by taking care of the pain that they don't know that they have. So I say this phrase now that my job is to look for the, and help you with the pain that you don't know about to help you with the pain that won't leave you alone. That's and awesome. that is also physical and mental. So say for instance, the, the um, mid back, very often you'll get a lot of pain in the middle of the back. And then most people will go after the middle of the back with some massage or um, chiropractic or manipulation, and that's good, and you should. But for me, I'm going to go, I know, even you know that that's the area that hurts, right? I'm going to look for the area that you don't know that hurts. Usually the, in the mid-back, it's going to be your sternum. So I'll, I'll press on the sternum, and that's a big lymphatic fluid block area, the sternum. So a lot of toxins gather in the lungs, and I know we'll get into lungs later, but that's where you hold grief and sorrow as well. And it's very puffy or swollen on the sternum or in between the ribs of the sternum. And it can be absolutely excruciating when it's got swelling and inflammation. And it's not supposed to be excruciating. That's my point. But nobody ever knows that it hurts until I stick my finger there. Then they go, oh, my God, I, I had no idea that that hurt. That hurts more than my mid-back. Right. So what you'll find is the body actually will manifest pain in the middle of the back because of the vulnerability in the front. And if I treat the one in the front that you didn't know about, the one in the back that everybody's been treating for six months usually ends up getting better. And then I'll do the same thing to your abdomen as well. So the abdomen is a big link to the lower back. But so when you look at physiology, you just realize that there's a lot of these things called nerve plexus and ganglia that sit there. And those are relay stations for pain, a relay station for compensation. So what happens is when you get a nerve signal that comes in from something, the, the, the body can send that signal any damn place it wants, right? I mean, and it, can, it branches out everywhere, right? And then it, and unless you really know how all these things interconnect, that they will, they'll appear seemingly unrelated. But here's the thing. There's nothing. There's never anything in the body that's unrelated. You just have to put it together with the, and, and look at the big picture of what it's trying to, to tell you. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the more areas that I find where somebody has pain that they didn't know about, the more I know one thing. There's more, there's more inflammation in the body or there's probably a lot of emotional things that are being stored that they don't know about. That's probably the biggest thing that they don't know is causing their issues are a, a trap, trapped emotions that they call it. Right. And I, hopefully I answered your question with, you with what you mentioned. Yeah, I know you, tied it, you tied it together, together really well. And I think I really wanted you to emphasize that point of how our emotions are so tied into what the physical body is trying to communicate to us and depending on what the emotion is like you said the grief is with the lungs and anger is with the liver and resentment can even be an ovaries you know i've seen a lot of women growing cysts and fibroids and lumps on their breasts because they haven't worked through all their trauma or the emotions suppressed emotions and 
the thyroid being, you know, our communication center and our voice, many people that can be suppressed and then things start to grow there. So I think it's so important to have that understanding that how we feel the emotion tied to it, the thoughts that we're having will all contribute to this pain that we try to distract ourselves with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting that you, you know, you brought your thyroid, um, you know, thyroid gland, and obviously that's something that you work through, uh, Perry. Um, Can you say that, you know, in your situation, did you feel like there was, like, I mean, you found a new voice in in this experience, but um, for you, could you kind of dive into your, uh, the emotional connection to the thyroid gland and, and kind of what you experienced? Because I think it's interesting to talk from that first person point of view. Dude, that's a really good question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. And I might actually <laughs> put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. But I want to warn you, I might actually get emotional when I talk about it because it's a lot of painful things in my history. Uh, and I've, I've sat back over the last year or two since I've started to get more involved with the emotional side of pain and chronic pain for myself, but also for so many other people because the, once I started to recognize the connection between emotions and physical health f- for myself, the universe just opened up and all of a sudden I just started seeing it everywhere, <laughs> right? It's, that's the way it works. It's, it's always been there, right? But n- now you've got the awareness of it. And it's almost like a calling in a way because then I'm like, where the hell did all these emotion-based <laughs> problems start <laughs> Coming from, I always joke around, it's like when you buy a car and then you drive it off the lot, you're like, when the hell did everybody buy my car? And it's just the way the universe works. And I, uh, they've been attracted to my work. And when I post things up, the ones that get by far the most response or the most questions are anytime I put something about emotion. Because I think we're all crying for it or we deep down innately know it and uh we're and when you find somebody that says it it's almost like you found what i call somebody called a sandbar once where you're so in this ocean floating all alone feeling like you're gonna drown and then you you found a sandbar of safety and i look back on it now that yeah, that's where your throat chakra sits too, right? If you follow that, that that's your that's your voice. And for most of my life, definitely my early life, I was um, very introverted. I was uh, shy, um, heavyweight, obese, glasses, geeky kid who had zero self confidence. Actually, hated every part of who I was got picked on a lot, got bullied a lot, never felt I could be my authentic self because I didn't like my, myself. So I never had a voice, you might say. And I would, if I would say anything, I would always never really be me. I would just say something to try to get other people to like me, uh, but it's not the real me. And then pretty soon you don't even know who the hell you are. And then you're almost scared to say anything, right? Because that that acceptance uh, uh, and we want, that's part of being human being. That's what community and, and tribes are all about, right? But that can be a very slippery slope. And I think all those years of self, it was actually hate in a way, I'll be honest with you, um, manifested itself. So that's why I... I use the phrase all the time and I, I can't remember who I read it from, but if you don't love yourself, you're never going to get well. And that stuck with me. Right. And that's one of the reasons why I struggled even after the cancer, I wasn't ready to see it yet because I was still practicing as a chiropractor, but I was still just a looking at it like, well, I'm a back guy, you know, I'm a pain guy. I mean, and I'll just get my cancer taken out and I'll get my radiation treatments and I'll go back to everything the way it was. zippity doo Everything's good. Uh, no, nope. it just manifested itself later about uh, 18 years later as an autoimmune disease. So it'll find its way out again. 
Mm-hmm. And then that started to look at my journey of just having to get self-love again and then looking at all the different emotional things that I've gone through in the, in the past and where I was holding it uh, in my body. And so I look at these areas now for everyone. And I just find now the largest area where most people hold their trauma that I've been finding is from the neck to the pubic bone in front, the anterior part. That's where most people hold it. But they, they just don't know what's there. Yeah, and one way to relate to emotions is that um, they're like the, the senses of our soul. Right. And when we're not paying attention to the communication that these emotions are trying to relay to us, it's like pieces of our soul is dying or we're losing pieces of it. And uh, it's Dr. Gabor Mate that says, you know, there's something within us that loves us so much that it's going to begin to whisper and then begin to scream and show up so big so that we can have that opportunity to shift or to lift that mirror in front of us so that we can shift our lives. And then now looking at you, you're using your voice. And I mean, the beginning of when, before we even started talking, you were saying that, be careful, give me a question and I'll go on for (laughs) half an hour. And it's like your, your journey of where you had to go brought you to where you are today to make that difference in people's lives. And I think when we can reflect back on it, not that people, not that we need to move through suffering and pain to get to the other side, but sometimes that pain can just be that indication that there's something, there is something on the other side and we can either suffer in it or we can begin to really discover and go through that self-discovery and that self-trust again, so we can bring back those pieces of our soul. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, it's interesting. To see. Yeah. And hearing your story, it's like, that, that pain that you went through is really like at the end of the day, it became a huge gift. And, you know, I think people don't relate to their trauma, their pain. Uh, and, and I don't see how you could initially as, as a gift, obviously there has to be some sort of unfoldment and different ways of looking at things, but man, like, yeah, hearing your story around that and just seeing, you know, the, the man that you are now, and it's like, it's, it's hard for anyone to not know that early side of you to, to go like, man, this guy does not have any trouble speaking his truth and sharing, you know, his ideas of the world. And it's, but it really shows the mastery of, of the human potential and the mastery of of you choosing that for yourself and, and deciding that vulnerability was important to to tap into. And um, so, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that because I think that, you know, that's, that story just allows people to go, huh? Like, why, why am I relating to my pain in such a negative way? Like, what if I could, shift the lens a little bit differently so I could see it through a different set of eyes. And so that's beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, that's the rub, right? We think everybody's got their stuff together and we're the only ones that don't. (laughs) And then you you look at everybody and everybody's got suffering that's going on that you probably can't even imagine. Um, But that that they're hiding it. Right. And, and, and it, it can manifest later, but you know, that's part of the journey that was able to get them to, to where they are right now. And the suffering has a way of, of forcing you to look at things in a little bit of a different way. Not everybody can, right? Sometimes the suffering breaks you and because you feel alone. So there's always this sense of a lack of control and feeling alone, where if you feel alone and not in control, you're not gonna heal. I don't care what, what you do. So you have to have that. And then we all need that uh, connection. That's why I just, listening to a client sometimes truly listening and caring about what they're saying uh, can make a huge difference in them getting better. And here's why all that stuff came back to the fluid part where I started to study trauma and stress. And then I read a phrase once um, in studying somatics that uh, trauma is stored as tension in the body. And I thought about that word tension. Well, what is tension influence? Fluid flow. So if you got excess tension, fluids can't move. They're going to stagnate or you're going to shift them and they're going to flow into one particular place only. So you get decreased blood flow in one place, increased blood flow in another, and then decrease can cause, cause pain and increase can cause pain. So it's too little blood flow and too much blood flow. 
you need Goldilocks syndrome and that one, you need it like just right in the middle. And so it all made sense because people have this uh, tension in the body that no matter how many massages they get, it just keeps coming back. So then you, you dig deep on what their daily habits are and if they have to have the work environment or the same posture and things like that, that's certainly what you want to look at. But then you'll usually find there's some um, emotion. Even that's going to be tied to emotion, right? And think about the person who's got to do the same repetitive activity every single day. They're probably freaking miserable. So there's some emotion tied to that, like you're trapped and you can't get out, right? So it's always going to be tied to something. So if I can release that emotional tension in the uh, body, uh, then people automatically just, they say like symptoms and their pain just disappears. It's just gone. Like somebody just waved a magic wand and poof, they, they disappeared. Right? And that's that the whole physiological connection to the psychological, you can't separate the two. It's not possible. Not possible. Uh, on that note of um, movement and tension, uh, you know, one of the other ways outside of physical movement that, that moves the lymph is the breath. And so can you, if you, what's your favorite breath practice or what are, what's a breath technique that you encourage your clients or patients to do? I actually don't have a favorite. Um, so when people ask me what my favorite breath technique, my answer is always yes. Um, because I, <laughs> I want it. to have a lot of different ones. Because I, I'm from a fact that if you do the same kind of breathing all the time, you're going to have a problem there too. Your body's going to adapt to one form of doing something. And to me, that makes you more vulnerable. If you were a one trick pony out in nature, you're going to be dead pretty fast, right? So you got to be able to, the most successful systems in nature are not, are not the most efficient. They're the most adaptable. That's really important. So efficient means you can be good at some things, but you better be able to be adaptable and uh, do a lot of other different things. So I tell people, do you like uh, do you do you like six seconds in, four seconds out, four out? Which one's the magic one? There isn't one. It, every single one is going to give you a different result for the time that you're in. I need you to explore all boundaries. The only thing I will tell people is that I want you to just try to not breathe in and out through your mouth during the day. Just do your, if you could just do that, breathe through your nose, but, and you can make a huge difference in your body. Just breathe through your nose during the day. And especially at night when you sleep, um, but many people can't breathe through their nose because they got so much congestion, right? so much mucus well what's mucus that's fluid right and mucus is protection so why the hell is your body lying down mucus so then you got to go back to the same thing again you probably got to detoxify yourself some way shape or form so mucus stuff is an immune system response right? mostly from an allergic response most of the time but you still got to go back to that because here's the thing for me is that i I've been a mouth breather for most of my life because I had such stagnated lymph that I couldn't breathe through my nose. I was always congested in my nose. I'd be snipping all the time. I'd have post-nasal drip. I would have phlegm in my throat, <clears throat> clearing my throat every five to 10 seconds. I mean, it was very annoying for people to be around me. And, um, it, but it was, I had to because it just kept dripping and dripping and dripping. So that fed the mouth breathing and then that led to the poor oxygenation that I had in my body and then the inflammation. So I couldn't get the breathing under control until I got the lymphatics under control. Then I could do the breathing that way. So even now it's so ingrained in my physiological adaptation to stress to breathe through my mouth that I have to constantly monitor it during the day to go through my nose and at night when i sleep i have to tape my mouth physically shut and i actually have to add two or three pieces of tape because i'll i forced it open <laughs> at night and then i have my wife tell me that i look over and you freak me out because i look like a puffer fist like i'm going 
<laughs> like I'm trying to blow out through my mouth. And she's like, I don't know if I should wake you if you're suffocating because I still want to do it <laughs> like that. As opposed to going out through my uh, nose. But that's what happens is that anytime your body is gone towards an adaptation to stress, whether it be a good or bad response, there's really no good or bad response to stress. It's just a useful response. So I read that in a, once in a neuroscience book that, there's no good or bad in relationship to the brain. It's only utility. It only does what it thinks is useful. We put labels of good and bad on it. Mm. And so that's a nice reframe, right? So here's the thing is that when you have an adaptation to stress, when you get under stress, it's always want to go, it always wants to go back to the same one. So you'll always have a tendency to go back to your, your lifeboat that you had before. Um, so in relationship to your, your, uh, breathing issue, I've tried all different types and people say, Hey, do you like Wim Hof? I'm like, yeah, that's good stuff, man. Do you like the, uh, uh, Buteco breathing? That's probably my favorite, the Buteco breathing. And I was like, yep, I like that too. I practiced, um, uh, military style type, um, sniper breathing where they do what's called a four, four, four count. That one looks pretty well. So it's a, four seconds in, four second hole, four second out, four second, that one, that worked pretty well for some people. But even that, sometimes that holding your breath for four seconds has caused a lot of people anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it, it, breathing to me is also highly uh, individual, highly individual. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I love that reframe of just utility. I think that's such an important, you know, mindset shift for people. Cause they often go like, well, you know, you're explaining the process of the body or what have you, or, or, you know, maybe the system approach and like, Oh, that sounds really bad. Well, it's, it's just, it's an adaptation. And I think that's a really beautiful way to look at it. Um, we are, uh, I mean, we're getting close to the end of the hour, but I, I do want you to speak a little bit on, on, on your, you've got, you've got so many amazing programs on your website. And so I want people to make sure they go to stop chasing pain.com. Um, and I want people to, to appreciate movement a little bit more. And you've got a restorative movement workshop that you do. Um, maybe if you could just speak to like how you talk about uh, breath, how you talk about movement and, and maybe a little bit more about some of those programs that people can access on your website. Great. Thank you. Yeah. The restorative movement originally started off as what I call primal movement chains and it's all ground based body weight movement things um and that's what started it all my very first workshop was on primal movements all those years ago and somebody said have you ever thought about teaching a class i'm like no not really because i don't know if anybody would actually show up and i said i'd try it so i i did it at a facility that is not too far from my office and uh 50 people showed up so I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe people like this stuff. And then I started to teach the program and the results were phenomenal for people. They really enjoyed it. And, you know, it's just, it's just moving down on the ground in many, many different ways. Some people call them with neurodevelopmental patterns, like going back to how you learn to move before you could walk. It's basically like rolling around on the ground and rocking and crawling and stuff like that, that, almost play in a way, but it tied into the fundamental things that I was looking for neuroscience is that, you know, the, the further you are down to the ground and the more body you have in contact with the ground, less you have to fight gravity standing up and the less stability you need. And so it's easier for your body to feel safer and more comfortable moving on the ground. So people got better faster because they could ultimately relax even at a subconscious level because they don't feel that they're threatening that when you're standing on two feet, they don't feel like they're threatened, but subconsciously in their brain, they are, they just don't know it. And so they would make leaps and bounds in their progress from being on the ground. And they realize very quickly that it takes an enormous amount of strength to move your body on the ground. It's not easy. You need these pivot points. So one of the tenets I teach is stability always precedes force production. So you need to have a stable base in order to generate force. So if I have more body parts on the ground, the more force I can generate. 
Because standing up, the only thing you have is your foot on the ground. <laughs> and usually one foot, that's called walking, <laughs> right? And uh, people got a lot stronger. And then I started to teach them like arising from the floor up. And that takes even more strength. It's a huge amount of coordination and strength in order to be able to take yourself off the floor to a standing position. And I just I did implement those into daily routines. Now, I found that if I can give you just one or two of these moves to do mixed in with what you already love to do, you're kind of getting what you need mixed in with what you want at the same time. And it was much easier for people to integrate it that way as opposed to giving up all of their typical training that they want. Um, that way it's what I call, it's kind of like giving your, your dog the medication they need inside the treat and they don't know that they're getting it. Right. So you sneak it in the dog <laughs> treat. Um, and that's what I did. And that's evolved over time to where I've actually gotten a lot less. One of my biggest pet peeves about helping teaching movement is that people get so obsessive compulsive about yeah. movement techniques and positions and you know if you're not this way when you do it that it's not going to work as well i don't believe in that i like variation variability and variety otherwise known as exploration so you can feel comfortable moving into all of them because when you're in real life you're probably going to get into one of those positions at some point that you never got in and when you were working with me and that's when you're going to get hurt it's the position that you don't expect to be in. Like you, like you're like, say for instance, foot position, like, you know, you want to make sure that your ankle is nice and stable. And when you do a squat, I'm like, well, usually you get hurt when you're step on something and you can't help it and you invert and then you get your ankle sprain. So in my world of training, I have you do different things with your ankle actually inverted on purpose. So we load you into areas that you're like, people say, oh, I don't want you to go there because you're going to get hurt. But meanwhile, I want to take you there, but in a controlled environment. And that takes the stress off of feeling that you need me to be there to make sure that you're moving right. So you feel self-empowered to move because every human being moves. And it's not, I always joke, it's not rocket surgery. It's not really difficult to do movement. Uh, I just need you to do a lot of different types. So that's why now I have what's called 4M motion. It's very, very simple. It's move more of yourself, more often, more ways, more environments. If you can do those things, then you're going to be a pretty resilient human being. Right? So that's pretty much what we do now. And then that's my top 25 movements that I teach people to do on the ground. If you can make your way through all 25 of those movements, trust me, you are going to be a monster. You're going to be pretty <laughs> strong and you're going to move a lot of fluids around. <laughs> yeah, you will be. Cause here's the thing. I got people that are, are really muscular and they can lift a lot of weight and they're actually good athletes on two feet, but I get people on the ground and they can't, roll from their stomach to their back and they struggle to get up off the ground a couple of times. And then that's a person who's got vulnerabilities yeah. that it, one, it can lead to injury later, but two, I try to tell them, listen, because you can't do those things, do you realize how much potential you're not able to tap into right now? Like if you could just do those things, what you're doing on two feet is just going to explode exponentially right? yeah we can definitely resonate with that as uh, kundalini yoga teachers what you're describing there's a lot of that movement in kundalini where you're on the ground you're doing funny things and you're really taking people to these um depths of them themselves and like you said there's fear around like just moving into that um, extension or moving into that space where they're afraid to go because of the pain but it's like you do it in a conscious environment so that in the unconscious environment you're able to stabilize and even prepping for my labor I would have my arms up for six minutes and doing rotations with my thumbs and it wasn't necessarily I'm not going to be doing that in labor but it was to 
create resilience in sorry system. in my in my nervous system and in my body and in my mind so that when that day does come the pattern's already there i can tap into that pattern mm-hmm. so i have, do you have okay, a question no, go ahead. yeah go so just for like the the last piece here i have a question for you um okay. if you had like a megaphone and you could like burst your voice into the world what's the one thing that you would want humanity to understand about itself Humanity to understand about itself? Mm-hmm. Hmm. That is a good question. Uh, it would probably be something that I think we all know, but for some reason, we either just don't see it, ignore it, or forget about it, is that we're all connected, right, to the same thread of energy or universe or whatever you want to talk about. And it just seems the world today that people feel so more disconnected than I've ever seen before. And I think that that is leading to this sense of uh, this overall degeneration of happiness and joy and health, right? And I would wish that we could find some way to, we're supposed to be able to get more connected through this thing called social media, but I actually see it doing the opposite. Right. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know if it's going to change anytime soon. I hope it does, but I would like to have a pretty big bullhorn and tell people just to stop Mm -hmm. for a moment and just look to your left or look to your right or, you know, maybe even look down and help somebody else up. That'd be pretty nice. Right. That's what I would say. Mm, Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. We could all use a lot more connection and, and yeah, that's a beautiful message. And that's, I mean, it speaks to just connection of the systems in the body too. Right. It's like the macrocosm is the microcosm and vice versa. And, you know, we're all craving connection with, with each other, with ourselves, self-love. And uh, yeah, that's a powerful message. So thank that's you. I mean, if you feel connected to another human being, you feel healthier, you feel yeah. more joy. Yeah, there's going to be a really big repercussion from this virus. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with the damn virus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's got yeah, to do absolutely. with our response to it. And yeah. it's going to last for 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 We feel the same way. So Beautiful. there's work to be done. Your voice is needed in the world so that that can be planted as a seed in every human. So thank you for using your voice. Yeah. Well, thank you for giving me an opportunity to. I appreciate it. I had a great time. It's crazy how fast an hour goes when you, when you oh, have I know. time, right? <laughs> Oh, but before we sign off though, I want to make sure that people know you've got a podcast as well. It's called stop chasing pain. Make sure you go to stopchasingpain.com. You can find Dr. Perry on Instagram. That's his main um, way that he creates connection with the world. So make sure all of you guys hit that up and listen, we're doctors. We we're learning from Dr. Perry, but guess what? You don't have to be a doctor. You can take it. And this is what I love about you, Dr. Perry. You have this accessibility that goes from, like I said, in the last pod- podcast, house moms to like to students, to whoever. People need to know this information. You need to take action on your health, with your health, and understand that this lymphatic tool, the primal movement, all these things that you're teaching are foundationally important and they're for everybody. So you don't have to be a doctor. Absolutely. You just have to be a human. That's it, right? There, there you go. <laughs> One criteria. Well, thanks so much. Dr. Perry is amazing having you on uh, Health Ignited and I look forward to seeing you again. Great. Thank you both very much. Thanks, Doc.